One of the hottest jobs in quantum computing in the coming years will be that of software engineer. We're going to need a lot of coders who can turn complex business needs into quantum algorithms and code, and they won't need to have PhDs either. However, the software engineer who's our guest today does happen to have a PhD in stellar astrophysics. We'll talk about how she went from working on the potential habitability of exoplanets to working on a software platform that can help companies with portfolio optimization, derivative pricing, and other use cases. Stellar topics after reaching a half-year milestone with this episode of The Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Karagiannis. I lead quantum computing services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. So our guest today is a quantum software engineer at Agnostic. That's Agnostic with a Q at the end. And she's rising in the field of quantum development, but she started out by reaching for the stars literally <laughs> uh, with a PhD in uh, stellar astrophysics. So I'd like to welcome the show, Dr. Anna Hughes. Hi, Constantinos. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining here. Um, so you had a real unique path to quantum development. So I, first, I'd love to hear a little bit about your work in astrophysics. Uh, and for listeners, trust me, there's a quantum computing reason I'm asking this that we'll get to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I finished my PhD at the University of British Columbia this past summer, where I was studying these things called ultra-cool dwarfs, which are the smallest and coolest stars in the universe. And I was looking for radio emission from these stars to try to learn something about their magnetic behavior, which we see um, the traces of that in radio emission. So I found that about 10% of these objects from a pretty small sample, because ra these radio observations do require a lot of time on very high powerful or high powered telescopes, um, about 10% of them do seem to have tracers of violent magnetic activity that could be uh, pose a threat to the planets that are orbiting around these stars if they do have them. So that was that was pretty exciting. And I was trying to understand, since we do see a lot of planets around these low mass stars, whether or not the stellar activity poses a threat to those planets. So, uh, so in that role, you were basically doing the same thing in that you had very limited access to machines because of uh, their, their scarcity, right? Yes, um, exactly. For, for, there, um, were, for study. Yeah. there were only a couple, really at a certain frequency range, only one that I could access that was powerful and sensitive enough to be able to measure the radio emission from these small stars. So, so you're right back where you started now, uh, with very limited access to very few powerful <laughs> machines. Exactly. Yeah. Very um, similar. Yeah. Um, so, not to get too off topic, but when, when I heard about the stripping wave atmosphere stuff, when I looked into your work, um, I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on the Fermi paradox. And and for listeners, that's this um, <laughs> seeming paradox about um, <laughs> extraterrestrial life, right? So. Drake equation, things like that predict that there might be um, all these habitable planets in life. And then the paradox is, why don't we hear from them? Why don't we see them? So I didn't know if you had any any thoughts on that kind of crazy topic. Yeah, um, the, the Fermi paradox is a hard one. There's um, all sorts of answers ranging from maybe we're the first generation of intelligent mm -hmm. life. So this is something that's quite rare to that other civilizations might not be particularly interested in contacting us. Um, or if this, the stellar behavior of low mass stars truly is, you know, quite violent across the board, and this is where most terrestrial or Earth-like planets are orbiting, then it might be that the planets that have the potential to host life aren't actually able to support that life because of the stellar activity. So we don't know, you know, if any of these factors are really behind the Fermi paradox, but they definitely complicate the situation. Yeah, so I... I I wanted to throw something like that in and bring up this next point that um, before we get to agnostic, how, how do you feel about using quantum computers also to further science? Kind of like maybe what Feynman was thinking when, when he proposed these in uh, 1981, this idea that the only way to study the quantum entity that is the universe is to study it with a quantum <laughs> system. Uh, are you interested at all still in like kind of tying those worlds together? Yeah, that's something that I really hope that we start seeing down the line, a shift, you know, as we get more and more sophisticated quantum devices, a shift from using only classical supercomputers for scientific research to maybe relying more on quantum devices. 
Okay. Yeah. So that's, I, I'd like to see that too. I, I feel like there's something there that we're going to uncover. Um, we're still in early days, right? Who could predict all the use cases? And I would like to see more scientific ones, definitely. So with that, let's shift to some of what you're doing now. Tell us a little bit about Agnostic, the company. Yeah, so um, we're a team of scientists and software engineers that are working on these deeply technical problems. And what we're doing is we're trying to develop an e ecosystem of tools and applications to make quantum computing more accessible to our clients. And we're really approaching this from a research perspective. So a lot of us, like me, are coming in with PhDs in different areas of physics or in math, and that's what we're used to. And now we're applying that to industry, where it's kind of similar, but you are moving at a faster pace. Um, and essentially what we're doing is as we enter this era of having you know, more computing um, like available and affordable to different companies is we want to build a bridge between those resources and between the companies that are interested in using them, but maybe don't know how. So if you're interested in using a quantum device, but don't have experience using quantum and you know, don't know how to use a quantum device, that's okay. You can still access it through our algorithms. Okay, so there's the two sides. There's like building um, your platform and then there's actually interacting with the customers. Is it the same teams interacting with both? Like, so are you responsible for more interacting with customers or for like building the platform? So my, my role primar primarily so far has been working on building the platform. I haven't interacted with customers yet, but I also am quite new. I've been mm -hmm. here for a couple of months. So down the line, maybe I will do some of that. Okay, so you're, so you're still building the core. And, and I know you guys list um, three applications on the site, uh, portfolio optimization, cyclical arbitrage, and derivative pricing, and those are all obviously financial. Um, are these the ones that you feel already are like canned, quick proof of concepts that you can give to customers? Is that why they're listed? Because they're already really well developed? Like you just kind of plug in their data and get going? Yeah, so customers would have to contact us directly because it is going to depend on the particular problem that they have. But yeah, we do have a handful of algorithms that are, you know, we've we've used them with particular applications and they're functioning quite well, including those three and uh, recently mm -hmm. diversification. Okay, so if if customers had like a completely different problem they want to approach, then it would be a different approach, right? It would be, um, in, there'd be a whole other process involved of like uh, developing what they want. Um, well, it would be so a little if, more handholding, right? Has, yeah. So if they have their own particular application that they would want to write, or if they would want to use one of our applications as a template for customizing their own, then they could, you know, do that. They could access our algorithms that we have online as is. They just have to reach out to us. Yeah, I saw that it mentions that you have like the purpose-built ones and then algorithmic libraries. Um, so, so how intuitive is that, it, and like how extensive is that? Are there um, like a lot? Are there? Is it is it really robust? Like anything someone could think of right now, would they look and say, "Oh, here's an example," or is it just like a handful? I was kind of curious because I didn't have visibility to that. <laughs> yeah, we have we have quite a few things online. So we have like portfolio optimization. You can access uh, quantum gate based algorithms, quantum annealing algorithms, CPU and GPU algorithms. Um, we have visualization, um, data acquisition, and pre processing. So if you are familiar with finance and that's something you work in, but you're not familiar with mm -hmm. quantum computing, but you would like to use a quantum device, then you could through us. And if you are familiar with quantum computing, then that's fine too. Then you would actually be able to interact a little bit more if you wanted with a quantum device. But if you don't want to interact with it at all, that's okay. You wouldn't have to with our applications. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so if you do want to get really um, hands-on, uh, is it a complete uh, development environment, like similar to, let's say, Composer, if you went to Qiskit? Or what, what's like the interface for someone who does want to get down into the weeds? Yeah, so it would be a Python library. So you, you need to have familiarity with Python. Python and, yeah, and so you could write your own application okay. as a Python script. You could use one of ours. Okay, so it's a library. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, so... A lot of customers have sensitive workloads uh, that they still don't trust to the cloud. Um, 
that just in the pure classical realm. And and this is always amazing to me. Like I'll talk to a financial customer and they'll be like, yeah, these, we just do in house these, these runs, these, um, you know, end of day kind of jobs and things. And, um, that that's strange, right? I can't even imagine like having everything in house now. Um, so they're concerned with moving quantum to the cloud too. And obviously that's how we access these machines because that's where they are. So I saw that, that, your company does obfuscation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that protocol and how you accomplish that? Sure, yeah. Um, I don't work on it specifically, but the quantum tools are quantum native and they're inspired by quantum homomorphic encryption. So the exact flavor that you're talking about is quantum circuit obfuscation, um, which is fundamentally mm -hmm. similar to traditional code obfuscation, but for quantum circuits. Um, so we actually have a patented protocol and have a pipeline of products that will be available as hardware scars, scales up. Um, so just have to stay tuned because we'll have more to come about that. Yeah, that's really great. Because I mean, at the end, obviously the quantum data is meaningless, right? When you get to the quantum computer, it's not like someone's personal information or a credit card yeah, number is there. He, 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 you know? exactly. so, yeah, and that's not there anyway, but this is more about protecting the approach, right? Like the IP that might be generated and how you go about doing something. So you're you're actually obfuscating the circuit and and what some company might claim is their advantage or their edge. Uh, advantage is a loaded word, of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, so so you mentioned you don't work on the obfuscation. So what what piece of the um, development puzzle do you work on specifically? Yeah. So um, so far, again, I am I'm quite new. I've been working on you know helping develop these algorithms as well as the applications and uh, writing a little bit in the way of tutorials that we'll have available as blog posts on how to use our applications. So we're hoping that these applications will be kind of a jumping off point. And these are Python scripts for our clients for if they want to do, for example. Um, diversification using one of our algorithms, then it'll be pretty intuitive for them to just follow along, see how we've done it, and then, you know, take that and go. So this is your first time then really working with algorithms, right? Um, in a quantum computer. I was just wondering how you made that jump and what like inspired you to move over? Uh, yeah, so it, it it is new in a lot of ways. And it's kind of the same in a lot of ways as well. So doing my PhD in astrophysics, um, I was, you know, coding to solve very difficult and very technical problems kind of as a, a research problem. And that's not really that different from what I'm doing now. Um, and doing my PhD in Vancouver, there were a couple of quantum computing companies around, um, like One Qubit is there, D-Wave is there. So as I was going through my PhD, quantum computing was something that I was always very aware of. And I'd even seen friends go on to get their PhDs in astronomy and make that switch to working in quantum computing. So that was a path that I definitely had always seen. Okay. Um, so when you were um, making that jump, you realized that you had that ability to translate um, that, that problem solving into the quantum realm. And, and that's one thing we're finding that some people have a struggle with, like a, a normal developer, they sometimes can't go from complex business idea and then bring it all the way to qubits, you know, <laughs> like they, they sometimes struggle with that. Uh, yeah. So, so we, we look for that. We look for like linear algebra skills. We look for all these things in developers. What kinds of, um, what kinds of advice would you give to like people who are trying to start out in quantum programming? Um, yeah, I think my advice would depend on what your background is. So like having done a PhD in astrophysics, I did take uh, graduate level quantum mechanics. I had taken linear algebra. So if you're coming from a background like that, where you do have some experience, then I would say it's not as difficult to make that leap. But if you, you know, are coming from maybe the computer end of things and aren't as familiar with quantum, I think there's, there's lots of tools online that I would recommend doing to familiarize yourself with you know the basics of quantum mechanics, and I know like Penny Lane and Kiskit have these great tutorials that you can go through to uh, to learn how to build quantum circuits and things like this. Yeah, yeah, we found it's it's not always easy for some people in the pure programming world to make that jump and and understand the uh, the concepts right away. So <laughs> it's it's a unique skill, right? Having all these things at once, it's like a perfect storm of uh, goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
So right now, your your platform um, can let you actually compare the results of what you accomplish. Um, so across different hardware types, for example. So do you have some kind of like sophisticated reporting uh, or like visualization tool that, that customers can use? Um, yes. Yeah, so we do have vis- visualization. I don't work on it specifically, so I'm going to have kind of limited okay. comment on that. But if you you know wanted to see how your particular application works with a bunch of different devices, because we ha- are hardware agnostic, it's really easy to switch in and out different devices. And you can tune on your own time, you know, if you want to see like really what device is going to work optimal for this problem, you can piece together which devices you want to use in which subroutines. So this is something that we would encourage our clients to experiment with until they get that perfect combination of devices. Because you're working, you're helping kind of create the platform. Have you, have you still been able to do any internal research, research where you... Um still try to apply to like a, a use case just internally to test the code, that kind of thing? Yeah, that, that's a large part of what I do is that we'll have the, the algorithm developed and then we'll think of a couple different ways in which it can be applied. So um, the diversification use for our selector algorithm is a great example where our selector algorithm will pick out the most dissimilar signals in a selection of signals that are also representative of their cluster. So um, that sounds very abstract, but the application of this would be if you're trying to build a diverse profile and you have a bunch of different tickers and you're saying, okay, what are the most dissimilar tickers? So maximally diverse, but are also, you know, still representative of their particular sector. If you take those tickers and say you take their daily returns over the past year, now you're working with time series data and feed that into the selector algorithm that can return for you a selection of however many you know, diversified tickers that you would want. So something like that was pretty cool, putting together uh, a time series case for this particular algorithm that we had. And do you then benchmark that against classical approaches to see how close you are to gaining some kind of, or how close you are to extrapolating some kind of advantage? Yeah, that's uh, something that, that we're actively working on. Okay. Um, do you have any guesses, ballpark, uh, to make about how that's looking if you were to draw a graph uh, off into space, you know? <laughs> um, this, this, like, always super fascinates me, just, like, how close people feel they're getting in any particular, you know, application. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the whole, you know, towing the line here. <laughs> um, <laughs> when quantum advantage will come... Um, I think we're seeing some pretty dramatic improvements in these small cases. And I think it's, it's quite promising as is, but I don't have an answer for you of when exactly we'll start to really see quantum advantage across the board. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a theory that annealers will give us our first real advantage um, with optimization. Yeah. I think uh, quantum computers... I, I think yeah, I, th- I think quantum computers are, especially annealing devices, are quite good at optimization problems. So if you have, you know, particular, particularly specific optimization problem, like you would get in a lot of finance cases, then um, yes, you can start to see quantum computers are quite excellent at those. Yeah, so when we talked to Sam Mugel at uh, Multiverse, they were doing uh, portfolio optimization where they got some impressive numbers by comparing to classical. They were able to do, instead of 33 hours of a classical tensor networks run, they were able to do it in three minutes, <laughs> which is which is quite a big improvement. But they sacrificed some accuracy. Yeah, that, accuracy. that is the thing. A quantum device would be fantastic if you want just an approximate answer, but you want it really quickly. If you want a very precise mm-hmm. answer and you have a lot of time on your hands, then yeah, you're going to want to go with a classical device. Yeah, yeah, for now. Um, are you doing any work on improving accuracy? Are you, is, have you reached that level of granularity yet where you could start tweaking and, and seeing improvements to accuracy? Um, on the code side, yeah, on the code side. I mean, obviously, hard work can get better. We all know that. But, yeah, um, um, so there's certain... It's sort of an abstract question. It's, it's, a hard que- <laughs> it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it very much depends on how you ask the question, you know, the answer that you're going to get. So if you're very careful and you're very precise about 
how you write your particular application or your particular algorithm, then you can edge closer to a, a more accurate answer. But that's more on the algorithm end. Mm -hmm. And do you at, at, and the team, do you have any benchmarks that you uh, traditionally run now? Have you like established a suite that you go to to see how performance is, is doing with any given application? Um, so that's not something that I work on specifically, but I do not know that. Work on? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I do know that okay, it's, yeah. it's part of our considerations. Yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling that we're going to squeeze. There's a lot more we could squeeze out of these machines with with the software stack than we're currently doing, right? I, I think that we can still refine and and get better results and better approach it, like at the sort of like combining our answers too, um, and running them on different machines and comparing them. So I, I'm just always curious if, if anyone's come up with any creative ways I haven't thought of <laughs> um, in that space. Um, so do you have any favorite pet projects you want to apply quantum to when you're ready at the company? Is there something that's like, like been burning in you? Like, oh, I just can't wait to apply it to this. Uh, um... When I think about like particular examples of how you can apply quantum algorithms to new applications, um, even thinking outside of finance, which is our main fo focus with the agnostic finance library, um, you know, having this background in astrophysics, a lot of times astronomy questions will occur to me. So for example, if we're finding a way to address outlier detection, and we're thinking about doing outlier detection in light curves, I think like, oh, I have all of these solar light curves on my computer. You know, we could break that up into different chunks and we could see when the sun is, you know, having heightened periods of activity as an example of outlier detection so that you could pick out, oh, this particular time chunk, the sun's activity behave dissimilar to these other time chunks. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I feel like quantum now almost gives you um, an instant uh, new realm of papers that can be written. You know, there are papers, any number of papers written on any subject, and then you could just say, okay, now let's apply quantum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. This is how, how we did we, it in the past, right? <laughs> yeah. How do we turn this problem into a problem that would be solved with a quantum device? And a lot of that is turning a problem into an optimization problem. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, there's the whole idea of looking at what... Um, uh, periodicity of numbers, you know, uh, examining like, like what essentially Fourier transformations were used for originally. And, and then, of course, they're going to be applied to grow uh, to Shor's algorithm. But um, so you can possibly be looking for numerous things uh, from the distant data that we're gathering, right? Just by applying it to quantum computing becomes a data problem all of a sudden. Um, so have you done a lot with um, machine learning and, and sort of and anything in that space? Yeah, that's something that um, that we're definitely dipping our toes into in quantum machine learning. Um, and there's a couple different things with like PCA that I've done on my end that's been pretty exciting. Um, PCA is uh, principal did you want to explain component. that? Yeah, um, PCA is principal component analysis. Um, so um, that's something that um, I've written a, a tutorial on that we'll have as a blog post later. But um, yeah, there's a few oh, applications. Nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I, I find that to be this extra fascinating layer now. No matter what science you're looking at, that's why I asked that question earlier about like how Feynman thought about quantum computing. Um, it just feels like, yeah, we read all those papers and now let's let's layer on quantum. You know, what what else can we find? What else is hiding in this data and the huge data sets that we've gathered over the years in whatever discipline? You know, so so I'm definitely excited about more of that. How do you feel about the state of sharing uh, information? in quantum information science right now? And, and do you feel like it's still open enough? Do you feel like companies are going dark? Um, I, I um, ask guests this question kind of regularly. Like, do you feel like people are going hush hush already and trying to generate <laughs> IP and to the detriment of society, you know? I, I haven't seen a problem with that so far. So every time that I have something, you know, new that I need to learn, which is quite a lot since I am new to this field, I've found the information readily available. But it's probably the case that as you start getting into deeper and more specific problems that companies are going to start, you know, maybe not wanting to share as much as, you know, something out of a university. Mm -hmm. So do you feel so far, um, has anyone at the company said, 
whoa, this customer came in and they had this idea that we never thought of and it, and it blew our minds. Have you heard anything like that in the virtual hallways? Or is it still <laughs> that uh, your your team is ahead of the curve of them, really? <laughs> uh, I haven't heard that particular comment yet. No, um, it still seems to be <laughs> okay. that the new ideas are coming internally. Yeah, I know. It's still so rarely that, that like a customer dazzles you and you're like, whoa, wow, who would have thought of such a thing? Just it's it's still pretty rare. Um, we do workshops with like big groups of customers and every once in a while someone will post one in, in the like virtual environment that we create for them. And I'm like, wow, that's actually a good idea. Why did you just share that with five competitors? And I don't know why you did that, but <laughs> but normally it's it's like tried and true things. Um so if you keep applying and, and working on papers in, in your other field, you're going to, so you're not really letting that go, right? It doesn't sound like you're truly letting go of the astrophysics side. Um, um, I, I don't plan that, on continuing to do astrophysics specific research. There's like a few small projects that I can think of that are very easily done in, you know, the quantum world. And I think that it's a fun way to show that this particular quantum algorithm works Right. But the, the focus in that case is the quantum algorithm and not the, the astrophysics. Side. Yeah. So it's like, okay. here's, a, here's a fun little thing that we we used the algorithm on, but the astrophysics itself is not going to be the focus. OK, so it sounds like you are a true convert then. I am a true convert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've given up zeros and ones forever. I understand. <laughs> um, in the binary world. So. Um, so the future papers you see publishing, then um, you expect they're going to be heavily on the quantum focus and and possibly having nothing to do with astrophysics at all, right? Yeah, um, we've just started uh, working on one, which is pretty exciting because it will be my first. Um, but yeah, the it, it's a quantum centered folk, uh, paper, not a astronomy paper. Okay, and do you? Uh, just a little bit about your company's culture. Is it like sort of like Google? Is there that, you know, 20% time or whatever they're, whatever the number, they change it all the time. But <laughs> uh, do you have like that kind of policy there where there's a certain amount of time they want you and encourage you to um, do research that would just lead to publication? Uh, I mean, things are, things are quite free, um, especially, you mm -hmm. know, on, on the research end, because we do want stuff to, we do want to have kind of a research approach to these. So we do have you know, we're welcome to take our own initiative in that sense. There's no like hard line of oh, this many minutes a day is what you may spend doing your own, you know, research. That's great. Yeah, that's sort of the approach I take uh, over here too. You know, like um, I was just talking to one of my employees about, about a paper she wants to write. So yeah, <laughs> I try to encourage that. I think it's great. And it could lead to other actual problem solving steps that that the company could benefit from you yeah know, i mean there's all kinds of things that that occur to you as you're starting in a research project of like oh i we could definitely use a quantum computer for this or like this could definitely be framed as an optimization problem you know yeah i agree so yeah it sounds like um you're off to a, a great start with this new frontier here. <laughs> so, so I hope to, to read some of your work in the very near future. And uh, thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me on. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Dr. Anna Hughes for joining today to discuss her work at Agnostic. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Prativity's The Post-Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Prativity. You can also find information on our quantum services at www.prativity.com or follow Prativity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. <laughs>